Okay, okay. we're well, running. Welcome everybody to the April monthly meeting of CCL. Great to have you all aboard. And um, particularly pleased to have um, uh, Denmark group well represented here today and um, lots of, um, and very, very pleased to have Graham Strong join us. So we'll, we'll, we'll come to Graham shortly. Um, the first thing is to just share some good news about what's been happening this month. And um, same as uh, last month, there was lots of excitement and interest because uh, you, there had just been a conference and lobbying in, um, in Canberra for, for New South Wales and ACT and lots of activity following from that. Um, we now have plenty of, plenty of activity that's followed on from, from Perth the conference we had in Perth last um, a couple of weeks back. And so Joyce is going to give a quick report on that so that we, um, because she's been involved in, very involved in all of that. And then I might add a few, a few, a few thoughts and then we'll, then we'll move on. So over to you, Joyce. Okay, thanks, Rod. Um, we've had three major events in the last um, month. The first one was a lecture given by the IPCC authors, uh, addressing uh, climate change. They did a lecture on this about two months ago and it was sold out. So we, we decided that we'd like to hear what they had to say or, or give some people that we hadn't heard before, give them a chance to hear what they had to say. And that was very well attended. I think 150 odd people. And then we had our conference, um, which, was, which was good. We kind of, uh, we had about 55 to 60 people at the conference. We had Jay Weatherall as our and we also had Dennis Ango, of course, and we were working on building alliances. So we had someone also from Farmers for Climate Action. We had someone from Doctors for the Environment and we had someone from Sustainable Energy Now, which is a WA group, a bit like BZE. Um, we also had um, an ecologist speak, which was um, quite good for um, increasing our levels of awareness about biodiversity, etc. And um, then our lobby days, about 14 meetings in all, I think, yes. and um, a couple of them with, with, um, um, with industry leaders as well. So all in all, it was a, a very, um, I think, productive uh, month for us. Thanks. Rod, you're muted. Thank you for that, Joyce. And I'll just add a couple of thoughts to that. Um, but we, um, we had a very clear strategy in our lobbying, with, um, particularly with the um, um, state labor government. And uh, we managed to uh, secure um, some really good meetings with, uh, with, with them. And uh, as a result, we, have, we think there's a good chance that the, um, that the state labor cabinet will, will um, be able to um, support us or endorse us in some way to, and, and, um, and add some influence in Canberra. So that's, that was a really exciting outcome. Uh, just that, wanted to add that. Um, okay, so now um, I'm now going to ask Peter to, to introduce Graham because Peter has um, met with Graham quite a bit over the, over the last week and um, I look forward to hearing all of that. Thanks, Peter. Okay, I'm just introducing uh, Graham Strong. Uh, Graham is a uh, farmer in southern New South Wales in the Riverina area. He's uh, a sheep farmer. Uh, the area of farming and forestry, and forestry related to climate change is incredibly important because it's two areas that, that can actually uh, remove carbon dioxide from the, from the atmosphere. Uh, so we'll be very interested in what uh, Graham's got to say. So Graham's been described as a, a, a climate-aware agricultural innovator and, and uh, a, a, over a long period of time, he's won a number of awards from that area. Uh, so he's going to uh, talk about uh, what solutions uh, uh, are possible in the uh, uh, farming sector and... Uh, and and, uh, and so I'll uh, now hand it over to Graham. Thanks, thanks, Graham. 
Okay, thanks, Peter. Um, sorry if I'm a little bit awkward. I think I've probably done Skype about once or twice in my life, so uh, so we'll see how we go. Um, yeah, look, I'd just like to thank the group for um, inviting me along. I I should just give the backstory. I just met um, some CCL uh, members up in Canberra a few weeks ago, um, just outside in the queue, and uh, piqued my interest when I saw their little um, their little. Uh, name badges. Um, so that's how the conversation got started there. Um, so I'm, as Peter said, farming in southern New South Wales um, near Narandra. Um, and I think it's pretty easy for me to say, um, fair to say, the last 12 months, is, or even longer than that, probably 15 months has been um, a, a real shock. I'm quite shell shocked by um, the weather patterns have been just off the chart in terms of evaporation rates, um, record breaking, temperatures, um, summer, and just a prolonged time of very minimal rainfall events that don't seem to amount to anything when you include evaporation rates. So we're talking, you know, five mil, six mil of rain, which um, basically just wets the dust and that's about it. And we went through the entire millennium drought, um, you know, cruised through that period from, uh, you know, 1995 to 2010 um, quite well on the back of um, a lot of adaptive work, which Peter alluded to that I've been doing on the farm. And um, so I thought that I was pretty well set up or set up as, you know, best of anyone to deal with what we've been dealing with in the last um, 12 months. But I tell you what, it's, it's been a wake-up call. Um, as far as just re-evaluating what I think I need to do, and I'm going to show you some um, slideshows of what I do and then talk about um, what, what we further need to do and, and what sort of re-evaluations I've, I've, um, I've encountered need to be called into question. So um, I think I'm doing the right thing here. I'm trying to open a PowerPoint. Um, can people see that? Yes. Have I yep. got, got it. Are, are, are you, am I on the big screen in the bottom or what's going on? I don't know. I'll just play. So is that filling people's screens and then? No, we can see. Yep. That's perfect. Okay, so got, okay, can I so just ask, the, uh, before you proceed, Graham, quite a few people still have. Uh, hang on, not hearing any audio. Can we, can we have other people muting, please? Because there's quite a, quite a lot of background noise that's interrupting. Okay. <coughs> okay, is everyone okay? Okay, um, um, I'll just start with these slides and just talk through them if that's okay. Um, now, these are just some pictures I just opened with of some of the country around me. Now, when you're looking at some of this stuff, um, it's important not to get, um, you know, management practices or, you know, arguably mismanagement practices confused with drought um, because the media gets that pretty confused all the time. Um, so I just want to show you some sort of contrasting examples of that that really mix practice with the reality of, of what has been a shocking season, um, just to show you how entangled they become and how it's, it's not a binary, simple, um, straightforward story. So this is probably some of the worst examples of uh, poor management combined with, um, you know, shocking drought, low rainfall, climate change um, types of events. And so th this could have been, you know, this is probably the worst, worst. You can see the kangaroo tracks along there <laughs> um, and I'll show you some, okay, so this is across, well, not across the road from that, but this is across the road. There's one um, uh, paddock across the road from each other. I'll just play a short video, which um, shows that. Is everyone hearing that?
Graham, there's no sound. If you want to speak over these slides, I think oh, it would be okay. good. Sorry, I, I was wondering. I wasn't sure whether there was any sound. Okay. Okay, so, so that was just a contrasting video. I'm sorry there was uh, people didn't get the sound, but I was, I was making commentary throughout it. Um, so you had two sides of the road. Um, one was probably, you know, the worst of grazing management or grazing slash cropping management. And the other side was probably the best example you'll get of um, no-till, um, a zero livestock type operation. But the, there are problems with that system too, being high, uh, high energy use. Uh, it's got its own high carbon footprint for other reasons from nitrogenous fertilizers and diesel use and you know, just a sheer volume of chemicals. Um, so it can become a biological desert in other ways, um, whereas the other place um, may not have had the inputs, but it's certainly, um, you know, it's got biodiversity loss and it's got soil erosion. So a lot of the country around me, it you know, typically looks like that. So apart from the odd paddock tree, it's pretty much a biological desert for a lot of the, a lot of the year. Um, it's amazing what does survive. Um, so our place was pretty much like one of those sort of places. It was a predominantly cropping property. Um, so I decided uh, 25 plus years ago to set about changing that landscape to something more accommodating diversity. So climate change wasn't necessarily on the radar, but it would, for me, it was more about um, biodiversity loss and soil erosion and seeing those sorts of things from uh, 90s, early 90s droughts and droughts before that. So um, we set about planting a lot of salt bush, doing a lot of the landscape, sort of textbook landscape stuff that um, I'm sure you're all seen and heard about with, um, drains and swales and sort of permacultural type stuff on a on a farm landscape scale um, there's a google earth map of some of the redesign work we've sort of done over the last 15 years um, to you know uh, laying out paddocks to soil types and topography fairly basic sort of stuff um, you know that's really necessary to do for sustainability before you even start talking about climate change okay and there's another shot some of this is salt bro uh, salt bush um, hedgerows and tree belts I mean this is a while ago now so a lot of that stuff's still grown up um, so here's a before and after shot of the type of landscape so that's the same spot there so you can see it's quite dramatic what we've done to the place we've planted about three million trees um, it's about 500 acres of salt bush the property is about four and a half thousand acres um, so we're going from a system like this, which arguably does retain carbon on the ground and has some carbon positive benefits, but zero till on the whole does not accrue carbon. Um, and there's been research to show that it's very, at, at best it will baseline carbon levels in soils, but because of the, um, and I, that's not even if you include the carbon footprint of the inputs like nitrogenous fertilizers and diesel. So admittedly that system, the positives are that it is highly efficient um, under its own terms, but if we want to actually um, draw down carbon, then we must go a lot further than simply no-till. Um, so that's just, I guess, how I've changed the country more to a a um, minimal cropping intensity, uh, predominantly grazing type operation. So it's a little bit more accommodating to um, tree planting, diverse pastures, perennial pastures, because if you want to get carbon in soil, you need deep rooted perennial pastures, particularly um, grasses called C4 grasses, um, which I'll go into later on. They're a type of perennial grass, which has a specific photosynthetic um, pathway that is able to store more carbon molecules in its, in its structure, but it also, um, it's more tolerant of extreme heat and drought. So we need to be looking at C4 grasses and any science, agri agriculture science, um, you know, needs to look at deep rooted perennials, particularly C4 grasses. Okay, so, you know, this is the typical landscape in a reasonable sort of year. Um, 
biodiversity is still a big thing for us in terms of our what we're aiming to do. Um, so we don't, you know, we keep all our paddock trees. We're not about knocking them over or anything, which unfortunately zero till tends to like to push out a lot of paddock trees and offset them with younger trees, which I've got a problem with. Um, you can't replace three or four hundred year old trees and superb parrots and squirrel gliders and things will tell you that also. Um, so just moving through, so you can see the landscape change. Um, some promising, I guess, things about salt bush, uh, old man's bush and perennial shrubs as a basis for livestock production is many of them have been shown to uh, significantly reduce the methane uh, production or methane byproduct of fermentation in the gut of ruminants. So a particular, a particular species from Western Australia called Eremophila glabra has shown, I think it's like 99%, you know, reduces the methane. Um, but salt, salt bush will do that as well. Um, I don't know if they're actually sure why, but um, that's what their research um, showed. Um, also on the horizon on that topic is, um, I'm sure if you all saw Four Corners the other week, is this um, type of seaweed that they've um, been researching that will, um, I think it's just about completely eliminates the methane production in ruminants. So, so there's some positive um, developments, I guess, in agriculture. Um, I know this week, you know, we've seen some people don't believe in that animals production should have any part in agriculture at all. But if you understand how agriculture works, they're pretty integral to making uh, the whole agroeconomy work properly. Um, and I, I'm able to say that from a landscape outcome, biodiversity outcome, they're pretty essential to, um, to the landscape. The problem with livestock can get into is obviously overstocking and all those sorts of things, but they're really functions of management, not of the animal themselves. Um, so portable watering points, being flexible, how you graze, trying to mimic um, grazing behaviour of, of uh, wild animals is, is something you try and do, lots of paddocks. Um, the drought is, and um, climate in general is um, a bit of a issue with kangaroos. I mean, yeah, they, there's, you know, hundreds and hundreds of them. <laughs> That's pretty difficult to, um, yeah, to control them. But, you know, yeah, we can't necessarily control them. Um, um, so wool and lamb, I think it's moving, it's the slides are moving itself. I think I've got motion sensing or something. Um, anyway, so that's our baseline um, uh, economic activity is wool and, and lamb and surplus animals, things like that. But we also, um, so salt bush land. So, you know, that's one of the things about it. Um, but we also, we also have, um, uh, cropping, uh, we do a bit of cropping, but we we do it in a way called pasture cropping, which is a very it's a low input, uh, minimal energy uh, type cropping system where you don't you don't kill the existing pasture before you sow your crop. So you leave your perennials in the paddock and you sow your crop with with the C4 perennial grasses ideally and let the crop and the perennial grasses grow together. The crop being an annual winter dominant um, crop will grow while the grasses remain dormant and then you harvest the crop and then your perennials grow up through the crop residue. So what you're, what you're trying to do is maintain a 100% um, ground cover all the time and you're trying to uh, use the old root channels of the perennial pasture for the annuals to to go down and find moisture. So you've got a sort of a, an agroecology or a symbiosis of plants going on and you're maintaining soil moisture and biology in the system all the time. So pasture cropping is um, one of those things and it's highly compatible with livestock production because um, you, you don't, the crop doesn't owe you a high yield because you haven't um, put a lot of inputs, although some pasture croppers claim they are getting, uh, you know, 80% of, of, of the, industrial farming's yield. So, so it's, it's got a lot of potential. 
again, needs a lot of focused research from a comprehensive national climate change policy, policy perspective. That's one of the things groups like Farmers for Climate Action are arguing for, um, so that targeted research meets, um, meets areas where it's, it's best placed to deliver a, a, an outcome. So pasture crop is one of those. I don't know what that was. So there's a little montage of pasture cropping. I don't know if everyone can see that on their screen. Maybe someone can unmute themselves and just tell me um, how I'm going. <laughs> um, Pictures are anyway, great. I, yeah, I hope you can see that on your screen. Um, so you've got in there. It's good. Yeah. You've got in there a mixture of, um, of different crop species. So there's about um, five different, like there's barley, lupins, a um, couple of different types of wheats, and you're growing it all in a polyculture with the perennial grass um, underneath there. It remains dormant. You're not killing anything, no herbicides. Um, yeah, so it's pretty, pretty uh, biodiversity friendly sort of practice. Now, now I just want to talk about, I've, I've, I've listed some of the, I guess, uh, landscape adaptations um, and things you can do for, on the farm perspective to reduce your carbon footprint, um, uh, restore biodiversity, address soil erosion, all those sorts of things, which incidentally were and still are massive issues before climate change became um, you know, on everyone's radar. I mean, we still had these problems of biodiversity loss and soil erosion and, and they're very much interlinked, which is, again, one of the reasons why we need a national strategy for agriculture is to get... It is, not me. Um, yeah, it's to get all these areas of research out of their and and actions out of their individual silos and into the agenda of um, under the portfolio of climate change so one of those another one of those things could be genetics and how the genetics of the animals the livestock you know the farm animals we're breeding how do they best serve um, climate adaptation and also you know carbon drawdown or abatement of co2 equivalents so one of those things is I mentioned the altering the diet of animals to um, reduce their methane, but there's also things, there's also huge frontiers with genetics that we can do that. Now, one of the things with genetics, these are the terrible types of uh, merinos that historically have been bred in Australia. Unfortunately, you don't, fortunately, you don't see many of these anymore, although there's, you know, there's still a considerable number out there. Um, the big, heavy, wrinkly, thick-skinned type animal, totally unsuited to um, a climate change um, future. Um, so I'll just run through the type or the phenotype of animals that we need to think about. Everyone knows the Brahmin cattle um, in Northern Australia and the big floppy ears and the fat storage on their back and all that. Well, that's pretty much similar. The, the similar logic applies to the um, animal breeding, sheep breeding in the southern southern states. So here we've got the old type merino, thick skinned. Um, blood supply to the skin is is not not the best. Um, it can't heat and cool itself efficiently. It has animal welfare issues with its wrinkles. Everyone's heard of mulesing and all that sort of stuff. Whereas these, this type of phenotype um, doesn't have the wrinkle. It has a thin, loose skin. Um, and it's got bare points so that uh, dust and debris and, um, you know, it, it can, it can you know, not get in its face. Um, it, it can thrive on dry feed in dry times. Um, yeah, it's, it's much better suited. It doesn't have the wrinkle you can see on these. It's a much better suited to um, heat dissipation. They've got, um, they've got big floppy ears too. They've, they're a lot... Um, um, bigger eared animals, similar to the Brahmins, cattle. So you can see there's the old type of animal and that's the, um, the more modern 
merino sheep. Um, Merinos, interestingly, because they're a multi-purpose breed, because they uh, have been bred for um, meat, milk, uh, meat, wool, and in Spain in particular for meat, uh, for, for milk, sorry, um, they have a very large, diver they have a very diverse gene pool. And I heard someone on Radio National the other day, they were talking about dog breeds, I had an expert in on dog breeds, had written a book, and the conversation with Philip Adams um, got to talk about sheep and he made the point and I this was great this is music to my ears he made the point the merino sheep is uh, one of the most diverse domestic animals we have um, so that if, if there's an animal base that we can use to start breeding towards adaptive features that's a productive animal for, for a climate change future this animal's it and we're already well down the road to uh, developing, uh, you know, just these amazing climate resilient sheep. Thanks to this man, Dr. Jim Watts, who sadly passed away um, earlier this year. He devoted his entire life to the animal welfare of sheep. That's, that's where he got his starting point. And as the years went by, he, he, he became increasingly concerned with climate change and the focus of his breeding, really seeing what he was breeding for in, in a sheep from a productive and an animal welfare point of view was totally sympathetic and symbiotic with um, adapt, an adaptive animal for climate change. So his, his um, work talked about the efficiency of an animal's blood supply to its skin. So obviously if an animal's got an efficient um, blood uh, capillary network in its body, it's better able to uh, thermoregulate. So one of the key features of these SRS merinos, um, they're called SRS because they're called soft rolling skin, is that they have a, a loose uh, flat skin, but they don't have any wrinkle and they have a thin skin. So they're one of the um, features and they're able to dissipate heat very well. Um, so they, they tend to, yeah, they tend to, um, work really well in hot climates. Um, and the fibres are really highly aligned. So if you look under the microscope, you see there's a typical traditional merino fleece under the electron microscope. Um, and down here you have the SRS type. So it's to do with the organisation of the follicle cell groups in the skin are more like a, a honeycomb of a European honeybee. They're arranged in um, a geometric um, pattern which which uh, is very space efficient um, and their blood supply to those follicle groups uh, uh, correspond in the same efficiency um, so the amazing work um, he's done and to try and keep track of all this genetics we use um, you know electronic ID systems that a lot of probably about 10 15 maybe 20% of livestock produced in Australia are moving to, certainly Victoria, it's mandatory, whether they use it or not um, to the maximums, not sure, but, um, but it enables us, uh, it's, it's similarly, that it's the same technology that people microchip their dogs essentially, um, but essentially we have a file attached to each animal which we're able to track all its visual traits and and also its its pedigree traits. So its reproductive value, how many lambs it's had in its life, how, whether it kept those lambs, whether it lost lambs. And so obviously in a drought, and this is where it gets back to climate change, is is if we're in a shocking drought, or uh, let's let's just park the word drought and let's just call it climate reality. Um, we need to be able to anticipate how dry it's going to be and be able to destock as quickly as possible um, and then rebuild our flocks as quickly as possible. Now, the problem and the reason why you get paddocks like the ones I opened with and also the ones you might see on the 730 report and, you know, farmers, you know, crying into their hat and all that sort of stuff is because people have not been able to destock quickly enough, early enough. And some of that is poor business management. Some of that is just bad circumstances or, or whatever. Um, and some of it is because they cannot identify which of their animals are the most productive. Now, you would have thought that that would be uh, 
an obvious uh, piece of information for most farmers, but without without uh, comprehensive genetic uh, records and information keeping and electronic identification of individuals, particularly on a sheep property where you might have you know five or ten thousand ewes or something like that, it becomes very difficult. So that's why we use that, and we we can record we record everything about these animals. So in a drought, I was able to very very quickly um, find my bottom ten percent. And, and get rid of them. Um, we'll not get rid of them, you know, sell them for decent money or just, just offload them before they did, did damage. Um, so, yeah. yeah. It's, Graeme, it's, well, the time's running on. Okay. I'll keep going. Um, another a adaptation is short tails on animals. So they enable animals to, um, you know, shoo the flies away. They're also an um, animal welfare issue, that sort of stuff. Um, and they're correlated with all those other sorts of um, things I talk about, about um, environmental fitness tend to correlate pretty well with phenotypic fitness. So you can see them there. Um, just quickly go through those. Pretty robust sort of animals. Um, you can see a bit of a contrast there between the two types. Um, just with at the end now, so Here's a little parting shot with, um, you can see how, how, I guess, uniform those sheep look. They're very robust. They, they just look like they really want to survive. Um, so that's, that's a drone shot of part of my property um, earlier last year. You don't have as much grass as that anymore. Um, yeah, but uh, anyway, this, this video is just very short. And just some of the tree planting there I've done over the years and incorporated old, old growth trees wherever I try and plant trees. Um, that's a little electric vehicle. Uh, it's a little Polaris EV. Um, yeah, we've, we've had that for about 12 months and put about 8,000 Ks on it and it's an amazing little vehicle. And um, I think I had some solar panels there so we're able to um, be fairly net carbon neutral with that when we charge it during the day. Um, yeah, bring on, bring on EVs. I think they'd be great in agriculture. Um, look, I might just quit there and just take any questions if, um, if there's time. Uh, th thanks, Graham. That's fantastic. Uh, just one question for me first. Uh, you've given us a lot of fantastic information. How many of these innovations are being taken up by uh, farmers more generally? Um, some of them, uh, yeah, look, look, I'd say the genetic stuff, definitely. Um, and I think that's probably where the low hanging fruit's going to be in terms of, uh, getting more farmers on board with action is to try and appeal to their appeal to what they're already doing. And, and because farmers are very proud people they don't necessarily like being told what to do. So if you can sort of stroke their ego and, um, Put them, put them in a light to say, you know, you're modern people, you're getting on with it and you're doing great stuff. I would pick with livestock, say electronic ID, and I would talk about, um, like, things like what I talked about is just this ability to, to make decisions early and to de-stock as early as you can, identify your most productive animals and then um, breed back from them. Um, the other, so those sorts of things are being adopted um, so, so I, you know, there, there's plenty of farms around that don't look as bad as the ones I showed you. So as far as the pasture cropping stuff goes, um, I think we've got a long way to go. Uh, there's not many practitioners of that sort of stuff in Australia. There's a few key ones like Colin Sice, you know, people might have heard of him. Um, but I think the problem is that we used to have a huge uh, extension uh, facility in our government agriculture departments and that has just been completely gutted over the last 20 years and and as far as climate change type extension goes uh, and education among farmers um, we know that they have gutted a lot of that funding and also we went at around that time even the phrase climate change was banned from um, departmental sort of speak so 
when you were talking to farmers, you had to talk about climate variability, not climate change, because that would, uh, you know, spook them. And um, I don't know. I, and and I, so that's been really regressive. Um, so I think I'm hoping after May that we'll, based on the hopeful outcome of the election, that we can see a turnaround in that and start getting some of this extension and information about the farmers. Because I think the problem with farmers is um, they, people often say, well, they, they, well, they are overrepresented amongst climate denialists and farmers for climate action. This is why that group, um, I guess, started is because they saw this as a problem. They saw that there were, there were, there was a good group of farmers who were very um, understanding of climate science, very accepting, and then there was a whole lot that were overrepresented. And I think, well, why is that going on? And we think that it's not just about the psychology of, of farming and the scariness of climate change and its impacts for agriculture. It's because of an active pulling of, of education away from farmers. They're just not... And also the, the negative um, influence of... Even some elements of agribusiness, unfortunately, are not really taking climate change as seriously as we should or there's private consultants out there who actively are climate denialists unfortunately who I, I get and I think the problem there is because um, if you've got uh, inconvenient news or bad news then there's going to be a market for good news isn't there and unfortunately people pay for charlatans to um, make them feel good so if someone comes in and says, oh, no, you haven't got a problem, it's just natural variation and here, you know, take this stuff and use this stuff out of a bag and spray it on your crop, you'll be right, you know. Um, so there's a little bit of that. Um, anyway, I know, I know that doesn't sound very hopeful, but um, I'm just trying to give an accurate appraisal of the political forces are very much um, of climate denialism, unfortunately, haven't gone away. I guess is what I'm saying. Okay. Any other questions from the uh, the, the groups? Yeah. One of our Denmark ones is about to ask. That's uh, Don. Um, yeah, Graham. I mean, one of the things I've noticed in presentations by other regenerative farmers is they'll show a property that is relatively drought resistant or climate reality resistant compared yeah, to yeah. the property next door. And you can just see, even if they are suffering a bit, you can see the contrast is enormous. And yet the farmer on the other side just continues to do the same thing. Do you find that's uh, your experience? Yeah, look, um, I do. I think people, the farmers that tend to involve themselves in regenerative farming practice have very long-term views of things. Um, so they, yeah, they tend to have a long-term view, whereas some often, yeah, people just look at farms as some, I guess some, some farmers just look at farms as, as a resource, as a return to capital. Um, you know, I'll, what, how can I make X return on this investment? Um, and they don't necessarily have a long, well, tell themselves they do but um yeah i, I don't know I, I really yeah i'm i'm at a bit of a loss too because i explain this stuff to a lot of people i even open my books to um other farmers and show them my cash flow and all that sort of stuff and you know it's pretty it's pretty unusual sort of situation because um you know i've been doing this sort of stuff for 25 30 years and i don't have a cash flow problem i've never gone into debt i you know, we don't go on overseas trips or, and all, all that stuff. I mean, we live fairly modest existence, but we don't we don't spend a lot of money. We don't turn our farms completely upside down to make a return. We we put resources into you know things like fencing and capital improvements, not so much risk taking behaviour like putting a whole lot of inputs on a crop and then. Uh, you know, crossing your fingers and hoping it'll rain. It's, it's sort of, there's a lot of gambling in that style of farming. And I think personality comes into it too. I mean, some, some people are just probably shouldn't be in charge of country because they, you know, I've, 
I'm a critic of it because they, they just gamble with it and they get off on it. They like to do that. Um, so there's a bit of, um, yeah, a bit of a, yeah, I don't know, that sort of problem. Then there's the average age of farmers, which is getting older. And so there's, there's uh, farmers there who, you know, in their 60s and that, they don't have very good prospects of any others coming back to the farm and they're a bit, they have a bit of a too late to change attitude. But I, I really think, I mean, Landcare did some amazing things at its peak and I think in some areas, you know, it really did change a lot of farmers. Um, and that's where I come from. I guess that's where the evolution of my practices and my thought train on this climate stuff comes from originally is land care. So just getting back to um, why farmers don't do things, I, I think government's got a lot to answer for and government and community needs to, we need, we need to get something like land care back um, and, you know, all the stuff that has been ripped out of research and development and extension in agriculture. Um, and I, I think that would be a start. And, and interestingly, I, I don't see, uh, there are just as many young farmers who are a bit gung-ho about farming and sort of a bit short term, a little bit nihilistic. So it's not necessarily an age thing. Um, and there's plenty of young farmers who are like me who are out there advocating, advocating for climate change action and all that sort of stuff. So it's a representation of Australia, I guess. Thanks, uh, Graham. We've pr probably gone a little bit over time now. So uh, if everyone would like to uh, uh, give Graham some things. Uh, can we say something? Yes. Okay. Neville, what are you going to say? Um, I came across something in the magazine. It's called Rural Rockstar, and it's about Dr. Charles Massey, who apparently has a 600 page handbook on how to change Australian agriculture. He's a sheep farmer and fifth generation, and he apparently works with Paul Hawken. So I'm asking if you know him, if you have any allies in this, this battle. Yes, um, certainly. Charles Massey, I, I've met him personally. I, I, don't, I, don't, I wouldn't say I know him, but I, I have met him. Um, he's, yeah, absolutely a hero of mine. And also, he's also he was heavily involved with Dr. Jim Watts, who I talked about with SRS Marinos. And so, they're, you know, they're all, they're, there's been some, there's some amazing people who are just light years ahead of their time in the industry. Um, no, Charles Massey is just, he's right on the money. He's, he's great. Um, and again, I just think that people like that need to need the support of government to form a vision. So, you know, Charles Massey has a vision. He's, a, he's able to articulate it. Um, someone like Peter Andrews, to some extent, tried to do that, but I think they failed because well, not failed, but um, their personality probably got in the way of their vision. Um, whereas someone like Charles Massey is really able to carry that vision um, through, I think, and would be, he, he would appeal to so many more people if, if I think the message could get out about him. Yeah, he could, he could be supported. Um, I mean, he's supported in a university. He's, um, he's a fellow at the ANU Fenner School, I believe. Um, yeah, look, I, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm at a point where I, as far as climate action, I'm pretty new to the game as far as networking with, with people around me. So, um, I've, you know, probably been in a little bubble of, uh, having family and all that for the last 15 years. And so I've sort of, um, I guess, re-emerged out of that era of land care stuff and just getting on with doing what I'm doing and sort of having kids and young family and all that sort of stuff, I've, I've sort of, I think it's put a bit of fire in me to just uh, get more networked and get more involved and try and see what I'm doing in the perspective yes. of climate change. And the drought, I mean, the, the last 12 months is just, it is just been crazy. Like I've never, never seen anything like it. And my, my dad and my parents, um, and everyone around here is just uh, even even farmers around here that are a little bit 
climate skeptic or you know won't won't talk about climate change uh there's a sort of a deafening there's a bit of a awkwardness they they know that this is game on they know that something very very strange is happening and everyone knows it's the elephant in the room all that um so we just need some leadership from government we need all the things that you're asking for uh, don you <laughs> wanted to say something uh, yeah, just very quickly for us urbanites, is there really any kind of quick advice you have for things that uh, urban people can do to help uh, promote your message? What sorts of things seem to have been effective, if anything, on that front? Um, that's that's difficult. I think um, I think yeah, try and notice people like Charlie Massey. You know, try and notice a notice people like him, read what he's got to say um, and, you know, talk about that with people. Um, I guess also just just be aware that the solutions in agriculture aren't sort of binary or black and white. I mean, they're just like, they're like every wicked problem or problem in society. So, you know, if people come up to you and say, oh, well, you know, just, just don't eat meat and everything will be fine and, you know, it's, it doesn't necessarily work like that. Um, and I mean, every, everyone here is smart enough to know that, but a lot of people who don't know anything about agriculture or complex systems will kind of run with that and just, oh yeah, we'll just, you know, we'll just get rid of all the cattle and that'll solve the problem. Well, you know, it's a hard ship to turn around. Um, I think the main thing is just everyone is just, just stick, um, stick it to coal, you know, I think, and farmers for climate action, that's why I sort of, uh, attracted to them because they they had a sing a focus of shutting down coal uh and not and education and adaptation and all the things i'm talking about as well they've run uh workshops around the country and there was one near me down in beechworth and all that sort of stuff to, to help educate people about climate change and adaptation but but they also you know are saying look we've got to stop coal because if we can't if we can't solve the easy stuff then i mean agriculture's um yes it has drawdown potential and it has huge potential but it's it's going to be a slow beast to turn around from the political perspective and the practical perspective um so maybe maybe carbon you know carbon pricing and some kind of way some incentive for farmers to at least secure baseline carbon in their soil is, you know, if they want to call it a subsidy, I mean, we don't get the subsidies like uh, our competitors in the OECD do. So I don't see, um, I think the, the, yeah, we missed an opportunity 10 years ago with the carbon pollution scheme and, and involving agriculture. And, and that would mean that, that uh, if you're producing in footprint in agriculture, you would have to adjust and change. So it's not, it wouldn't be a subsidy for everyone. It would, it would require that people change, but it would reward practices that Charlie Massey um, proposes. So uh, I think if urban people could see that um, as being a worthwhile spending of uh, what is now drought subsidies, I, I think to ask you, the taxpayers and the urban taxpayers to go and fund bailing out of unsustainable practices uh, and you know these tear jerking stories on on the national news. I think that is very short term, and I think that is it's it's there's no pride for the farmers either. I mean they're not they don't you know they don't necessarily like that kind of handout stuff, and and I think that's really wrong headed. And I you know and it's I don't I don't even believe this sort of uh, donations of hay and fodder are particularly helpful if they keep propping up unsustainable practices. Um, yeah. Thank you. I think we okay. need to stop. Fantastic. Thank you for that answer and thank you for all the wonderful information you've given, but also Thanks, particularly the ways in which we can support uh, farmers and for climate action. And uh, you mentioned uh, the, um, the national strategy for climate, climate aware agriculture, is, is that what it's called? Uh, well, just a national strategy for climate change um, and agriculture would be one of yeah. those portfolios. But yeah, I mean, 
that's yeah. something that we can support uh, directly in our in our meetings with members of parliament, and we can make that one of our supporting asks, and um, we will do that yeah, from, from there on. And, that, yeah, is where yes. if we if everyone lobbying just just tries to focus on the same things, big things, then mm. yeah, I, I know there's there's farmer uh, farmer sort of carbon groups around that aren't farmers for climate action that kind of want to go in the direction of um, or seem to be sort of talking about making money from carbon credits. And I just think that's a little bit distracting. I think we, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's probably why I sort of tended to sort of look to someone like FCA because they tended to align more with uh, what you guys were doing. That's true. We're very, very happy with our alliance and we'll continue to, to foster that. And um, okay. thank you, Graham, for what you contributed to that today. And um, oh, thanks, Rob. Wonderful to have you aboard and feel free to stay on for the next five minutes if you wish well, when we talk about our monthly actions, but um, feel free to go if you oh, want. Yeah. If you well. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. Well, we learned a heap of, heap of very, very important stuff there and I just want to notice, point out that um, when we had our, the launch of the uh, Parliamentary Friends of Climate Action last month in, in, um, in um, Canberra, um, Verity Morgan Schmidt from from FCA was was one of the one of the um, people there, and I think you were there too, Graham. So, or at least a couple of other of your members were there. So, um, we have a, a very public uh, alliance in, in in that setting, which was really good. I'm just going to share my screen briefly to 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 show you um, some suggested monthly actions that uh, that we can uh, uh, we can engage in over the next. Um, the next month, particularly over the election period. I'm pressing share and here it comes. Okay, sorry if that's a bit small on your screens, but um, essentially um, during, the action, during the election campaign that's happening over the next um, four and a half, four, five, is it four weeks now? Um, 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 okay, if possible, um, support for Farmers for Climate Action's call for a national strategy on, on climate change and agriculture. And um, you can look that up on the website. Uh, the, the Farmers for Climate Action um, website has, has information about that strategy. And it's, I think it's an important thing that we can support. Um, generally, raise the issue of climate change and its solutions at every opportunity. Um, so this is not just uh, with the MPs, but with uh, friends and neighbours and people that you're bumping into who are ultimately electors, same as you. Um, feel free to talk up the Australian Climate Dividend pr Plan because that's a, a very, very positive and, and um, 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 yeah, climate, a very, a very positive and um, carbon pricing initiative. And also don't forget to talk about um, Canada's fee and dividend legislation and the fact that Canadians are getting their first dividend this month, um, and some of them, and that's a really exciting development. Now, most MPs have, and other candidates have public meetings around the electorates um, in, in the, in the, during the election, so if you have time and space to get to those, please do and, um, and ask about their solutions for climate change. Now, with Labour MPs, I think it makes sense for us to appreciate their climate policy and suggest that they can still add um, a carbon fee and dividend to their policy and um, if possible promote uh, the Australian Climate Dividend Pro Plan as well. And uh, that will also to, when we're meeting with coalition MPs, to, to encourage them to consider joining Parliamentary Friends of Climate Action and if they're not able to at least ask them, you know, who, who, who else they could recommend from their side of politics to join parliamentary friends. And of course, write letters to the editor about, about climate and the election and our solution. Um, this is a great opportunity. There's, lots, there's going to be lots of, um, lots of stuff in, in the newspapers over the next few weeks. So there's our chance to join in. So um, this, I'll email the link to this, uh, to this action sheet to everybody and it'll, it'll be um, linked to the, the, the recording of this video which will be going out to, to our members over the next few days. So back to you, Peter. Um, 
Um, our notes is basically me, me to wrap up now. So thank you everybody for, in, for, for joining the call and um, we look forward to seeing you in a month's time um, and um, look forward to hearing all, all the, um, the, the actions that's been uh, taken over the, over the election month. Thanks again to Graham. It was wonderful to have you aboard and um, looking forward to seeing you next month. Thank you. <laughs> please unmute Peter so that people can say their goodbyes. Goodbye to everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you next month. Bye. Lovely to see you all. I'll see you all soon. <laughs> Bye. 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 <laughs> Thanks again, Graham. That was a really powerful, powerful um, sharing of your experience. Turn yourself off now. You can turn yourself off now. Leave the meeting here. Thank you. Bye. Leave end meeting. Mm -hmm.